I said, well, what are we going to do? He says, we're going to go to Mexico City and we're going to break the 200, the 500, and the kilometer. And I'm like, okay. <laughs> Welcome to the Canadian Cycling Magazine podcast. I'm Matthew Puro, editor of the magazine and your host. This episode is a rebroadcast of our look at the 1980 Olympic boycott. It happened 40 years ago, but contains some lessons for what athletes are facing today. This very day that this podcast comes out was supposed to be the start of BMX competition. But in March, as rising COVID-19 cases sent nations scrambling the Canadian Olympic Committee and the Canadian Paralympic Committee announced the Canadians would not go to the 2020 Games. Two days later, the IOC said it would postpone the 2020 Olympics for a year. Recently, as we pass the one year to go until the rescheduled Olympics date, talk of cancelling the 2021 Games started up. On July 22nd, the president of the Tokyo 2020 Organizing Committee, Yoshiro Mori, said to Japanese media that if the pandemic continued as it had been doing so far, the games could not go on in 2021. A few days before that, the Kyoto News Agency released the results of a poll that showed only 23.9% of the people surveyed throughout Japan thought the Olympics should be held. 36.4% thought the games should be postponed again. 33.7% said they should be cancelled. With the threat of Olympic cancellation creeping in once again, let's listen back to track cyclist Gordon Singleton and Steve Bauer and road cyclist Louis Garneau as they discuss the time, 40 years ago, that the Olympics didn't happen for Canadian athletes. In December 1979, the Soviet Union invaded Afghanistan. It may not seem like a global event that would affect Canadian cyclists, but in mid-January, its effects started coming to North America. U.S. President Jimmy Carter called for a boycott of the 1980 Summer Olympics in Moscow if the Soviet Union didn't pull out of Afghanistan by February 20th. In March, Carter announced that no U.S. athlete would be heading to the Games. By the end of April, the Canadian government of Prime Minister Pierre Trudeau, as well as the Canadian Olympic Association, supported the U.S.'s position. That was it. No Olympics for Canucks. I first spoke with track sprinter Gordon Singleton about how he dealt with the boycott. When Singleton missed the Moscow Games, he got creative. I saw him at the Track World Cup in Milton in January. It seems like a different time now. We were all looking ahead to Tokyo 2020. COVID-19 wasn't something that seemed to affect us. Hi, my name is Gordon Singleton, and... I competed in the 1976 Montreal Olympics. I was also a member of the Canadian 1980 Olympic team. We were uh, all inflicted by the boycott, the, so we didn't get to go, but I was on that Olympic team. In lieu of the fact that we didn't go to the Olympics in Moscow, um, I broke three world records in Mexico City. That's a, a productive time away from the Olympics, I would say. Yes, and, and it was... Uh, it was an interesting story because it was uh, when the Canadian government just realized that Canada didn't get to go to the Olympics, they took approximately 20 of our top medal hopes and they funded any project or any World Cup or anything they wanted to go to. Well, in cycling after the Olympics in 1980, the season was finished. And so I didn't know what to do. And my cycling coach was from Great Britain, and I remember calling him up, and he was an overachiever. And I called him up, and I said, I'd like to go to Mexico City and break the 200-meter world record. And he says, we're not doing that. What are we going to do? And I told him the government was going to pay for it. And he says, I said, well, what are we going to do? He says, we're going to go to Mexico City, and we're going to break the 200, the 500, and the kilometer. And I'm like, okay. <laughs> So anyways, he came over to Canada and North America and we prepared for the final three months up to October 
of that year, 1980. We went to Mexico City. And when we did it, this is the story. It wasn't in an atmosphere like tonight where there's all these screaming fans. It was on a, a Tuesday morning in the middle, and there was nobody there. And I had to get up on the track and say, okay, go break a world record. Where do you find the motivation for that if there isn't this, this vibe like we have here at Milton tonight well, at a World Cup? I think the motivation came from just the fact that, you know, I wanted to achieve and it was something I, when once I set my mind to, it's like I'd really like to try and accomplish that. And my training building up to it really showed that, like, this is a possibility, you know, and my results were there. So we went and we did it. I say we because I wasn't, it was me, I rode the bike, but I had some help. I had... I had my coach and I had helpers and mechanics and things like that. So, yeah, we as a team, we went to do it. Weeks after I spoke with Singleton, the Olympics were postponed. I could see similarities and differences between today and what happened 40 years ago. Roughly four months away from the Games, athletes had their plans all messed up. For the riders of today, safety was a big reason for postponing the Games. Also, even if the Olympics could have run in July, What kind of competition would it be, populated with athletes who weren't able to train because of lockdowns? But there was the hope that things would simply be delayed a year. Maybe everything would be fine, just later. But all-out cancellation still loomed. Back in 1980, it wasn't a health crisis. It was politics. The U.S. and Canada and other like-minded countries wanted to wreck the Moscow Games. If enough countries pulled out of the Olympics, it would embarrass the Soviet Union. All of the effort that the country put into the Olympics would be for nothing. Canada, the U.S., and others hoped those games would, essentially, be worthless. To find out more about what the boycott meant for other Canadian cyclists, I spoke with Steve Bauer and Louis Garneau. Canada was trying to wreck the games. In the process... It had wrecked the Olympic dreams of its athletes. We'd been uh, team pursuiting, you know, as a group since, uh, well, when I was a junior, 1977. Um, and uh, Commonwealth Games, Pan American Games in 79, I believe, in, uh, I think they were in Puerto Rico. And so, yeah, we, we, we'd actually had a core group of guys that were, you know, solid team pursuiters, and we'd, we'd had some success internationally. That's Steve Bauer. You no doubt know him from his silver at the 84 Olympics, his stints in the yellow jersey at the 1988 and 1990 Tours de France, and many more significant performances on the road. But in the late 70s, Bauer was focused on the track, together with riders such as Gary Trevisial, Peter Suderman, and Claude Langlois. And so that that was the goal, you know, the goal to uh, race in the Olympics and then team pursuit, you know, obviously a big task against the Eastern Bloc countries at the time. But, uh, yeah, like any athlete's dreams to uh, have a shot at the Olympic Games would, uh, was was where we were headed. Okay, uh, 1980, um, first of all, I had 21 years old. That's Louis Garneau. Today, he's the president of the cycling clothing and equipment company that bears his name. Back then, he was a young rider who wasn't really dialed into global politics at all. Just to give you an idea, I started racing in uh, 1972. So at the beginning, I I was not a great racer, you know, and uh, I I, I started to to progress in um, 1976, you know, junior was a good sign for me. I won almost all the races in Quebec and uh, I raced also in Canada. So I did I did pretty well. You know, when you're a cyclist, you're, you're 19, 20 years old, you know, you, you you don't check too much politics, you know, what's happened in the world. Uh, when you are a cyclist, your ego is very big. You know, you just, you look for yourself, you know, and uh, you look to... Uh, because at this time, uh, imagine that you don't have cell phone, you don't have computer, you don't have, you know, uh, iPhone, you don't have zero information except the newspaper. So if you don't look to the newspaper or check the TV, you don't know too much about that. At this time, uh, the, my preoccupation was more to race, to take care of my performance, you know, and uh, 
I was only in love with the bike, so I didn't take care about all the politics. Garneau was headed for the games, but a call from his coach informed him that their plans for Moscow wouldn't go ahead. Garneau was disappointed and got a lesson on politics and sport. But I was also surprised why the government used us athletes, you know, to uh, contest uh, the, 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 you know, the a decision. So uh, I just remember my frustration at this time, and I said, I don't understand why you use athletes, and you can maybe use other other things than than small athletes, you know, like us. Uh, and uh, we are not part of that, you know. We do cycling because we enjoy, and uh, you know, racing. It's another thing. But I just realized at this time, at 21 years old, uh, uh, Olympic Games is also uh, a politic games. You know, you just you you're, you're angry that that politics come in the way of sport, um, but they're sort of part and parcel, and even. You know, to this day, we understand that a little bit even more of how politics and and power and, uh, you know, financial resources influence sport tremendously. Uh, That's just the way the world turns, so to speak. And uh, at the time, it's it's um, you just don't understand it, really. You're just angry with the the situation and why it happened is, is sort of not understandable. You know, as a young age, you just don't understand it. I asked both Bauer and Garneau if anything good came out of the boycott. No. Nothing. For Bauer, he lost time and experience. Same for Garneau. But for Garneau, he does remember some important words from his mother, which became his motto and the title of his book, Never Give Up. The only thing I can I can say that, that was positive for, for me personally, because at the end... If the government didn't do the Olympic Games, you know, we, nobody won. We didn't win nothing, you know. In 1984, the Russians decided to don't come to LA. I think everybody lost time. I think everybody lost uh, good time, you know, I, when we talk about athletes. And I don't think we changed a lot of things for the, the politics or for the government. So, uh, but the only thing, uh, it's positive with the uh, the boycott of 1980 was my motto like never give up my louis and try again and you will win in 84 you're going to make the selection so this is my good memory this is my best souvenir for the boycott because the rest it's pretty negative you know, I was still a young athlete, so it wasn't sort of the end of the world, right? It wasn't like a, an athlete in my prime. Would would our team pursuit team had a shot at a, at a medal at the Olympic Games? Likely not, but uh, you know, the participation experience would have sort of thrust us in a, in a in a different realm, I suppose. Um, I continued to race uh, on the track uh, for the next couple of years through doing participating World Championships. Um, and then, you know, gradually transitioning to the road. Uh, I think my first road world championships was in Goodwood, England. So I did, I did track and road that year. And then, uh, you know, eventually transitioning completely to road race, road racing by 84 and then turning pro. So you can see the evolution of, you know, a, a team pursuit or track athlete as I, began to understand that my, my, my strength was on the road or, you know, as I matured as an athlete, then I transitioned to the road racing 100%. Bauer was able to keep racing and building his cycling career. Garneau had slightly different plans. Even though he was young too, he didn't feel as if he had as much time left as a competitive cyclist. Still, he couldn't let go of the Olympics. After that, I said... Okay, I forget about that, and um, I, I'm I'm gonna again never give up. I'm I'm gonna make another. I'm gonna try to do another selection because it's not easy to do another selection. You know, you need the perfect timing, and I had the chance to do that because I said after the Olympic Games, 1984, I'm gonna quit. I want to do another thing in my life, and I decide also to start uh, my company, Louis Gano Companies, in 1983 just one one year before the Olympic Games. So I have a, 
a, a real plan, uh, very serious. And I said, okay, I'm going to go. And then my, I'm, I'm going to do another thing in my life. You know, my goal was not to be a cyclist for the rest of my life. You're like a competitor. I, I'm a cyclist, but not a, a racer until 40 years old. And I said, I want to start uh, the business. Business is like um, a bike race. You know? But the problem with the business, it has no finish line. It's all the time. You can work seven days a week. You have no rest. And you can burn yourself or you can perform. You can do very well. You can win at the international you can also uh, fail, uh, like right now we have a, a, a bad period, but uh, we will we will come back and survive because I have the same attitude in 1980. Uh, I missed uh, the Olympic Games, but I said I never give up, and then I'm going to try again for the next four years, and I'm going to make the Olympic Games. This is it. Garneau, Bauer, and Singleton all found strategies for coping with the Olympic boycott of 1980. Singleton was able to get creative. His was a masterful pivot. He couldn't win medals, so he just broke world records. Bauer, with his, well, what can you do and roll with the punches attitude, and his youth, kept plugging along until the next Olympics. Garneau seems more the planner, but his story highlights a feature all Olympic athletes have. That is, determination. It got him through the difficult times. The qualities that all of these athletes showed 40 years ago are qualities today's athletes can turn to, with all of the uncertainty that they continue to face. And that's the episode. It's put together by me, Matthew Piaro, and mountain bike editor Terry McCall. It's produced by Adam Killick. He composed the music, too. I had help from web editor Lily Hansen-Gillis. Thanks to Ontario Creates for its support. And thank you for listening. Please rate and review the show, and I'll talk to you later.